This is the Healthcare Marketplace Specialization, Healthcare Marketplace Overview. I'm Steve Parenti, and this is Module 5.1.2, Medical Tourism, Evolution, and Growth. So what is medical tourism exactly? That's a funny term. It's a term that's arisen recently, and it's been a rapid growth industry. The idea is that people will come from all over the world uh, and are traveling to other countries to obtain medical, dental, surgical care, but at the same time, um, they're not that infirm so that they'll actually do a little bit of touring, vacationing, and really experiencing the attractions of other countries that they might be uh, visiting along the way. So uh, while it's growing a lot today, it's actually not a new concept. Uh, it's really, honestly, thousands of years old. Uh, in ancient Greece, pilgrims and patients came from all over the Mediterranean uh, to the sanctuary of the healing god. Um, there were, in the 18th century, uh, wealthy Europeans who traveled to spas from Germany uh, to the Nile. There were also the reverse migration of uh, hot springs going on in uh, Europe itself uh, for folks to, uh, to visit. So if we look actually across a much wider uh, span of history, we can see that um, you know, hot springs were really one major area to travel and for the notion of thermal springs. There was an exception, uh, a... a um, desire to find the fountain of youth in the 16th century. The term spa really gets underway quite a bit um, in the 17th and 18th century in terms of where people were going. For dealing with tuberculosis, otherwise known as TB, uh, folks would look for sea and mountain air to help them out. And then we get to the 20th century, we have different areas that are health farms or places where you can sort of lose some weight along uh, the way and uh, be rejuvenated. So it's, it's, it's a pretty strong and long arc. Now, in terms of actual medical tech, it's a little different. Um, so when we think about um, the different types of technologies, it's not just coming for spa treatments. We can actually have, say, if you look at different places here, say organ transplants in certain spots. Uh, India does a tremendous amount of cardiac care. There's LASIK procedures that are done there as well. Um, dental treatment is one area that uh, goes uh, pretty well in different places. Uh, there's cosmetic surgery done in Cuba. So, and these, when you look at the numbers of people visiting, it's pretty substantial. Um, honestly, Thailand's amazing, actually. If you look at the, the number, this is an older statistic, both from the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, granted, they've heard a little bit by the tsunami prior to this, but um, it's a lot of money that's actually um, making it into the doorstep. So what's driving this? Um, so there's an estimated number of 47 million Americans that had no health insurance prior to ACA. Now that number is roughly about 38 million that still remain. Um, there's a, there is an issue, though, for those 47 that uh, many of them are getting high deductible health plans. And so there's actually a lot of money that gets paid out of pocket. And they might decide to go abroad and not pay it in the U.S., there's also a much more substantial number, 108 million people in the U.S. that are without uh, dental insurance. And what you find is that nearly two in five adults, or approximately 77 million people, you know, struggle with medical bills, even with ACA. And they have uh, lots of medical debt. And so the thought is if they can find a cheaper source um, to essentially get their care and avoid medical bankruptcy, um, that might be a very desirable uh, thing. So... Just to give you a sense of why would they go abroad. Um, so in the U.S., just for example, a knee replacement right, might run somewhere between $27,000 and $32,000. To go to U.K. Uh, and say a private hospital there, that could be $16,000, $18,000. Those aren't pounds. Those are dollars. Um, but if you go actually over to India, uh, the Max India Healthcare Center is a very uh, major thing, or even to Singapore, um, $6,000. And the quality is actually very comparable. Um, when we look at um, cabbage, or what's known as cardiac um, artery bypass graft surgery, $30,000 in the U.S., $6,400 that are here. Now, you might ask, why the difference? One of the things that's a major difference, particularly in India and Singapore, is that um, much more so in India, India is operating on a cash-based economy. Singapore, to a certain extent, is as well. They have a lot of uh, very high deductible plans that are there. There's a certain amount of... Um, cash that the expectation is paid for the initial services unless it's really extraordinary care then the insurance will kick in and so when you have essentially a cash-based economy 
you don't have as much of, if you will, the moral hazard risk we talked about in Module 3 that could occur. Now, is, is essentially a threefold difference a, uh, a moral hazard risk? Maybe. But clearly, these are the prices. And what's also interesting is that the physicians that are many times doing some of these procedures in Singapore, Thailand is the case as well, might very well be Western-trained physicians that are just visiting and bringing their families while they do the medical procedures at the same time. So how might this work um, in terms of a uh, supply chain process, if you will, for getting in? Basically, a patient has to figure out if they are a candidate for international care. They have to figure out what their transport is going to be. They have to get there. They have to make sure that everything is sort of squared with the actual country that's operating the facilities, Ministry of Health. They have to figure out their own scheduling components of what's there and then ultimately get treated, make sure everything's okay. And if if their preoperative stuff's doing just fine, They could actually structure a tourism plan, which on the one hand, you're like, "Ah, that's kind of crazy. But honestly, for some of the cardiac procedures, the recovery time is relatively quick. Uh, So you might even have a situation where if in three, four days, you're really expected to be up and about a little bit and moving. And that could be tied to a resort that's really more of a recuperative facility. Uh, And then once you're sort of done with all that, you could go home. So it's, 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 it may seem a little bit extreme, but depending on the technologies we're talking about and recovery times, it could be, given the cost, actually much, uh, much cheaper in the end. So here's a discussion prompt for folks to think about. Is medical tourism a sustainable phenomena or is simply a uh, passing fad? If so, why? Uh, if not, why not? And, and how is medical tourism going to affect healthcare in the developed countries, say the U.S., England, and Canada, and then the developing and underdeveloped countries, um, whether we're talking about Africa for potentially some of the underdeveloped countries and developing or emerging economies, China, India, uh, and elsewhere. This concludes our module on medical tourism.